Okay, uh, so for today, we're going to be uh, going over uh, some of the news articles, right, that we'll be going on uh, over uh, from the newspaper, right, that we'll be going over. Uh, the first article uh, that we have, uh, the opinion article that we have would be about uh, the recent uh, sort of happening or war in Russia and Ukraine, right, that we'll be going over. Right, so uh, America and its allies want to bleed Russia. They really shouldn't, right? And so we're going to be going over uh, the war, right? That people have been talking about. Uh, <clears throat> the war in Ukraine has entered a new phase. It is no secret that the initial invasion went badly for Russia. Expecting easy victories, the Russian army inflicted terrible destruction, especially in its shelling of cities, but for the most part, failed to take territory outside the southeast of the country. Ukrainian resistance was fierce after six weeks of war undermined Russia. Uh, Russia, Russia forces were made to retreat from Kiev and its suburbs. In the hope of winning new victories, Russia has now confined its forces to the south and east of Ukraine. The main battles are taking place in small towns and villages along the Donbas River. Russia talks of cutting off the Ukrainian army from the Donbas, but so far its forces have made slow progress advancing from the Black Sea coast. In response, the United States and its allies have also shifted their position. At first, the Western support for Ukraine was mainly designed to defend against the invasion. It is now set on a far grander ambition to weaken Russia itself. Presented as a common sense response to <coughs> Russian aggression, the shift in fact amounts to a significant escalation. By expanding support to Ukraine across the board and sh shelving any diplomatic effort to stop the fighting, the United States and its allies have greatly increased the danger of an even larger conflict. Uh, they are taking a risk far out of step with any realistic strategic gain. Russia's more limited focus has proved more manageable for its armed forces. The bloody siege of Marpol is for practical purposes not complete, and Russia has... Uh, secured the town of Izium while bombarding minor cities, but these events, which have come at, at a cost, are limited. The likelihood of Russian territorial events far from Crimea and the Donbas is now remote. The shift from general to limited conquest was already a concession on Russia's part. The Russian leadership has blamed a single factor. It claims to be fighting not just Ukraine, but the NATO system in Eastern Europe. Hubris and uh, clumsy tactics are more to the point, yet there is no denying that the United States, Britain, Poland, and other European NATO members have been parties to the conflict from the outset. It is not just military transports and trucks carrying tens of thousands of anti-air uh, craft and anti-armor weapons to Ukrainian fighters. The United States has also provided real-time intelligence, reportedly including targeting information on the, on the location of Russian forces. Though the Pentagon has disputed the extent of intelligence sharing, leaks have been uh, remarkably re revealing. We now know that the uh, United States provided the tracking intelligence that led to the sinking of the Moskova, uh, Moskva, the flagship, uh, the flagship of uh, Russia's Black Sea fleet. More striking still, U.S. intelligence agencies provided critical targeting for b battlefield assassinations of Russian ger generals. This was already a significant form of uh, participation in the war, but the United States has since shifted its strategy to push Russia further. The early U.S. response to the invasion was simple. Supply the defenders and apply America's unique financial weaponry to the Russian economy. The new strategy called it Bleed Russia is quite different. The underlying idea is that the United States and its allies should seek to recover more from the rubble of Kharkiv and Kramatorsk than the survival of Ukraine as a pol polity or even the symbolic frustration of Russian aggression. Top officials have made that quite clear. The U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin has said that the goal is to see Russia weakened. The Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, said Ukraine is defending democracy rights large for the world. Uh, Britain's foreign minister, Liz Truss, was explicit about widening the conflict to take in Ukrainian territory annex annexed by Russia, such as Crimea, would, when she sp spoke of evicting uh, Russia from the whole of Ukraine. And this is both an ex expansion, expansion of the battlefield and a transformation of the war. Whereas once the primary Western objective was to uh, defend the against the invasion, it has become the permanent strategic attrition of Russia. The outline of the new pol 
policy began to emer emerge on April 13, when the Pentagon called a convocation of the eight biggest American arms, the shift from general to limited conquest with already concession on Russia's part, to prepare arms transfers on a grand scale. The result was a pledge made by the made by President Biden on April 28 that the United States would provide four times as much military aid to Ukraine as it had already supplied since the beginning of the conflict, a promise made good by a proposed aid package for Ukraine worth $39.8 billion. This, this, this strategic shift has coincided with the abandonment of diplomatic efforts. Negotiations between Ukraine and Russia were always fraught but contain moments of promise. They have now they have now stalled completely. Russia bears its very fair share of responsibility, of course, but European channels to Moscow have been all but severe, and there is no serious from the United States to seek diplomatic progress, let alone ceasefires. When I was in Ukraine during the first weeks of the war, even staunch Ukrainian nationalists expressed views far more pragmatic than those that are routine in America now. Talk of neutral status for Ukraine and internationally monitored plus besides in Donetsk and Luhansk has been jettisoned in favor of bombast and grandstanding. The war was dangerous and destructive enough in its initial form. The combination of expanded strategic aims and scotch negotiations has made it more dangerous still. At present, the only message to Russia is there is no way out. Though President Vladimir Putin did not declare general conscription in his Victory Day speech on May 9th. A conventional escalation of this kind is still possible. Nuclear weapons are discussed in easy tones, not least on Russian television. The risk of cities being reduced to chlorium remains low without NATO deployment in Ukraine, but accident and miscalculation cannot be. So once again, uh, so the diplomatic ties between Russia Right, uh, Ukraine, also U.S. and other Western countries that we do see, right? Uh, there are complications in the uh, sort of uh, diplomatic uh, sort of uh, matters, right? That we do see here uh, in this article, right? That we do see here uh, as allies want to believe Russia, they really should it. So again, uh, the complications, right? That we find here as well. And then uh, the next we have more of an opinion sort of based article where uh, it talks about sort of uh, room for uh, saying I feel like, where I think it's fine to say I feel like, I bet others do too, right? Uh, the idea of feelings of how they feel, leaving room for disagreement, is gracious, not timid. And so we'll uh, read through this sort of opinion-based article and then we'll move on to right, the other uh, sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, articles right, that we'll take a look at. And so uh, the article will read, uh, <clears throat> I want to take up a language peep and uh, I hear a lot about the uptick in often the younger people prefacing their opinions with I feel like. I feel like it's a matter of duty. I feel like people are ignoring the consequences and so on. The rub for many is that the phrase sounds wishy-washy as if there is an epidemic of hedging amid a new generation. Some have suggested that discussions and meetings might be less productive or that we risk undermining our own uh, arguments by using the using the phrase, but is that what really happens? The esteemed Cornell University linguist Sally Mac McConnell Again, it's quoted in, these, in this 2016 Times Opinion essay by Molly Horton has ventured. This is speculative, but I feel like fits with this general relativism run rampant, it, adding that there are different perspectives, but that doesn't mean that there are not some facts on the ground that things uh, and things anchoring us. And I, I fully take her point that equ equivocation isn't always called for, but this usage of I feel like can be seen through many lenses. One of them is through Amazon, Amazonian. Looking at the Google's Negrim viewer, you can see that the phrase has had a significant upswing in the 21st century. The question is whether it's being used in its literal meaning or whether it is a frozen expression that happens to be moving in on a older one that means the same thing but enjoys wider acceptance, I think. Under this analysis, I feel like is an example of how words and expressions for the same thing coexist and compete at all the and compete all the time. For example, the use of based off what you said instead of based on, or it took up around the same time as I feel like, as I noticed among my students over the past two decades. Yet yeah, few would impute a particular significance to this change. Expressions can change like fashions. 
In the aforementioned time speech, the University of Pennsylvania linguist Mark Liberman said, I feel like the emotions have long since been mostly bleached out of feel that, so does he speak the phrase as a neutral pre preface, preface, not an uh, expression of timidity? Whether he used it himself in that instance to be right, I don't know. Uh, I feel like we should take a break. I think you're right. Dot dot dot. Need be classified as a certainty or undue. Uh, uh, let's take a look. Undue a few years, a few, a few years earlier when uh, interviewed for an article in Jezebel about the perception that I feel like it's used more by women. That's possibly signaling that relative to men, they feel the need to soften their opinions. Mr. Liberman said that he there could be a case for it or. Could simply be that women are generally about a generation ahead of men in most cases of language change. He subsequently wrote that if women evinced a lack of confidence in their assertions, there we would expect to see them using other hedge markers such as seeing sort of, sort of, maybe, with significantly greater frequency than men. But in casual speech, he said that doesn't bear out. When language changes, it's often women who start doing the new thing first. Women as early linguist uh, adopters is often happened with up top. In tone statements as questions, something increasingly more gender neutral, as well as something as quotidian as the gradual shift to using have instead of have. This tells me that if women are using I feel like more, it's, it, is, it isn't because they're shy, but because their expression is just an example of a typical vanilla change in ex language. Even I think if you think about it, uh, is uh, 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 is less a uh, conclusion than expression of opinion, which is I feel like is, but these expressions of opinion, uh, opinion, uh, needn't be classified as uncertainty or undue uh, accommodation. Rather, both expressions uh, instance state a distinction made in a language worldwide called evidentiality. We know languages situate things in the time according to tense, but sometimes we are less aware that languages mark how speakers know what is that they are stating. In some languages, this evidential marking gets awesomely explicit. In the language of the Amazon called Tu Yuka, to say they are chopping trees alone isn't enough. You have to choose for a wide range of suffixes to indicate how you know. If you saw it, you say they're chopping trees with the suffix I. If you heard it, G-I. If you heard about it from others, Y-I-G-I. If you suppose H-I-Y-I. In English, we don't, if we don't express evidentiality with a special set of suffixes used only for that purpose, but instead use words that otherwise can mean other things. Apparently, they sell them in the summer too. You say so about you say about something you've heard around, but if you believe you hear the pizza delivery person arriving, you say that must be the pizza. When you call something, you say. You, uh, something as an opinion you say I think it's a matter of sincerity or these like or these days I feel like it's a matter of sincerity on old, on the old radio and TV show Favor Mickey and Molly Favor was uh, regularly bedeviled by a little girl teeny who would come by and engage him in rambling conversations her catchphrase was I betcha an evidential expression signaling awareness that something might be untrue but that one is nonetheless confident it is true enough to be willing to place a bet on it. In one 1939 episode, Favor says Tinny, well, that's a cute name, and she answers, sure it is, I betcha. Even if someone out there thinks her name isn't cute, she's pretty sure it is. Uh, the expression I reckon serves a similar purpose. Chaucer used the phrase I, I just said or I guess in his work with the same basic meaning as for us today. If I reckon is uh, warm and quaint and Chaucer's I guess is literally literary and noble, then we ought to wonder why I feel like it's taken as a marker of rhetorical weakness. When people preface their thoughts with I feel like they're indicating the source of what they're about to say is reason but not categorical. Tacitly, they're leaving an opening for op opening for others to disagree, but this is less cowering than gracious. The heart of human linguistic communication is pointing out something that something all are familiar with, and then indicating something novel or useful or unexpected about it. This is what language evol evolved for, not private illumination or expo exploratory dialogues, but which came later and piggybacked on the on the. Uh, 
on the uh, on the uh, basic function of enlightening others. Something Tom uh, Tom Scott Philip gets to the heart in the speaking of our minds, and Charles Taylor also explores the language animal. But the languages go further than this because all of them are vehicles of nuance. All of them allow speakers to indicate how sure they are of what they are communicating in various ways. That must be the pizza one surmises because it was ordered a half hour ago. I feel like the pizza won't get here in time you say, although you can't know for sure, are open to someone else's assessment. Of course, there are gradations of confidence that they indicate they touch more certainty than I feel like, while I believe indicates more certainty than I think. This indicates and less attention to degree and detail. An anthropologist might document these phrases as neatly allowing speakers to register three degrees of qualified certainty. So if two cause speakers have a suffix to indicate that they suppose perfectly confident people say, I reckon, and I and no one would accuse mid Middle English speakers of self out for saying, I guess, then I feel like we can say English speakers are doing just fine today. Of linguistics at Columbia University, or Lexicon Valley, right? Physical and the new uh, religion, which is uh, back America. So once again, uh, <coughs> uh, a study about language or linguistics in some sense, but the idea of how uh, the softness of the language itself might be opening a sort of dialogue for a room for some kind of an open dialogue or some level of disagreements which brings sort of discomfort in a lot of sense, right? Between racial tensions, between political sort of uh, uh, turmoil that we might have, but how uh, sort of uh, that room for disagreement might still be there and a and a hope for uh, some kind of accord to come together right in the in the midst of the disagreement or in the midst of the uh, sort of uh, sort of political sort of conflict right but that there might be a sort of uh, even a, a sense of sort of uh, uh, unity unity that comes along in those uh, in those uh, sort of uh, uh, in those uh, areas of discord, right? That we might find as well, right? With these sort of uh, the softness of dialogue or uh, rhetoric, right? That might be brought uh, here as well, right? That we might find as well. And so, uh, we'll take a look at uh, another uh, sort of article about uh, Japan or uh, <coughs> about more uh, about uh, sort of the uh, economics in Japan, right? That we'll be taking a look at. Uh, more inflations plus a weak yen no longer working for Japan. And so we'll read through an article, right, that will be based on Japan, right, that we'll be going through. Uh, this time more of a uh, sort of economic or uh, sort of social science based, right, that we ha uh, find here as well. And so let's take a look. Uh, former formula for success failing as currency falls and food and energy costs soar. For years, Japan tried to spur its coronal chronically weak economic growth, its pursuit what its central bank saw as a magical formula, stronger inflation and a weaker yen. It didn't quite work as intended. Inflation never met the government's modest target, despite rock bottom interest rates and heaps of fiscal stimulus. Uh, workers' wages stagnated and growth remained anemic. Now Japan is suddenly getting what it wished for, just not in the way it had hoped. While overinflation means moderate food and energy costs are rising rapidly and outgrowth not of increased demand but of market turmoil related to the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the yen has hit a two decade low against the dollar has dizzying dropped more than 18% since September and has unnerved Japanese businesses. The twin forces are posing yet another challenge for the world's third uh, largest economy as Japan trails over major nations in emerging from the economic blow of the pandemic. The rise in prices has uh, spooked Japanese consumers used to decades of stability and the weak yen is uh, starting to look as if it will depress uh, demand at home more than stimulated abroad. The yen depreciation is attacking the weakest point of the economy, said Takahide Kuyuchi, an economist at the Nomura Research Institute who serves on the Bank of Japan, Japan's uh, policy board, households, he said, are facing an increase in prices of every imported good, and the situation is undermining consumer sentiment even in, even in event of actual inflation. In a, in a previous era, when Japan was a manufacturing superpower, a weak yen would have been cause for celebration, making Japanese exports 
cheaper abroad, increasing the value of revenue earned overseas and attracting foreign investment. But exporting is now less important to the overall Japanese economy and companies seeking to avoid trade restrictions and take advantage of cheaper labor costs have begun to produce <coughs> more of their uh, products overseas, reducing the impact of exchange rates on their, on their bottom line. A Bank of Japan report released in January found that although a weak yen uh, continued to aid the economy, its po positive impact on exports had shrunk it uh, has shrunk over the decade leading up to the pandemic. Its contribution to inflation, however, had increased during the same period. The pandemic and the war in Ukraine have all have most likely amplified the negatives and diminished the positives, said Naohiko Baba, chief uh, Jap Japan economist at Goldman Sachs. Prices have been rising because of manufacturing shutdowns in China and broader logistics chain snobs, as well as the war's impact on the exports of Ukrainian wheat and Russian gas and oil. For resource poor Japan, which is highly reliant on imported fuel and food, the drop in the yen has already uh, has driven already high prices even higher, with the cost of some necessities rising by double digit. Uh, percentages for the first time in over a decade, consumers are paying more for Asha, Asahi beer, and one brand of convenience store chicken had its price an increase in more than 35 years. From the perspective of exporters, the weaker yen should be beneficial, but uh, for others, it should be neutral or negative. What well, Mr. Baba said. Uh, he added that the potential upside of the currency devaluation has been further reduced by Japan's uh, decisions to continue bearing international tourists who might be eager to take advantage of favorable exchange rates. Uh, there are a number of reasons for the yen's uh, weakness. Uh, Japan's economy has faltered during the pandemic and skyrocketing commodity prices have forced importers to sell more yen, yen for dollars to pay their bills. But the main cost, uh, experts say, is Japan's, uh, Japan's insistence on maintaining interest rates near zero, even as other central banks uh, led by the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve raised their own uh, drastically. The widening spread has triggered a rush to buy dollars as investors look for better returns. And the exodus seems likely to continue. Last week, the Fed raised interest rates half a point, the largest jump in over 20 years, and has said it intends to continue raising borrowing costs as it seeks to cool rapid inflation stoked by booming American job market and uh, rising wages. Wages in Japan, by contrast, have barely budged, and the country's uh, high employment levels have remained comparatively steady. That means that Japan's inflation, which overall means under the government target of 2%, is most likely driven by supply-side issues caused by the war and the pandemic, not the increased demand that low interest rates are intended to produce. In theory, the Bank of Japan could stand the yen's devaluation by raising interest rates, but its governor, Haruko Kuroda, whose term ends next April, seems to yet set to stick with his policies until he achieves uh, inflation of both the quality and quantity he envisioned nearly a decade ago when the Prime Minister at the time, Shinzo Abe, uh, nominated him. Modest inflation driven by consumer demand, the thinking goes, would create a virtuous cycle of economic expansion. Companies' profits would grow, sparing interest, investment, wage growth, and domestic consumption. In late April, Mr. Kuroda doubled down on his commitment to low rates, increasing the Bank of Japan's purchases of government bonds. Uh, the announcement was followed by a yen sell-off, sell even if Mr. Kuroda wanted to raise rates. Doing so yet may, may set off a cascade of economic consequences, said Jean Park, a, a, a professor of political science and international relations at Loyola Marymount University, who studies Japanese monetary policy. Japan has come to rely on big spending to stimulate its economy, Mr. Park said, and raising rates would cause could both make that approach more difficult to continue and make Japan's uh, national debt, which stands at over 250% of its annual economic output, harder to service. While com economists are disagree about whether the level of debt is sustainable, policymakers are eager to chance it. High inflation is politically toxic and trying to correct for it, the medicine is also an extremely bitter pull. Mr. Park said if they raise interest rates, that's also going to be unpopular. 
Like Mr. Kuroda, uh, Prime Minister Fumiko Kishida has brushed off suggestions that the Bank of Japan should seek to strengthen the yen by raising interest rates. Instead, he has sought to combat uh, rising prices with more stimulus. This year, Parliament has signaled, signed off on several rounds of subsidies to Japanese oil companies that are intended to lower gas prices. In April, lawmakers announced an additional round of subsidies and this there are cash payments of about $380 to families with children. Some politicians have suggested that the Bank of Japan should go shore up the yen's value through currency market interventions, uh, selling its own uh, dollar holdings to lift the Japanese currency. But that's an expensive proportion that is unlikely to have much effect, said Saori Katada, a professor of international relations at the University of Southern California, who studies Japan. Japan's trade and monetary policy. These days, the central bank has already given up on intervening in the market. Ms. Katara said the whole market has gotten so big that the actual intervention doesn't change it. It might change it for a few days, but it won't change the trend. Right? So, uh, once again, we do have uh, uh, sort of uh, the economic policies of how right uh, the recent COVID and how uh, situations have uh, affected many of the countries, including Japan, right, that we would have read through as well. And then another sort of uh, interesting article about uh, the Korean and Japanese sort of uh, forming more warmer ties, right, that we do see here as well, by right? visiting lawmakers from Japan pledge warmer ties with uh, sort of the officials of uh, uh, of Korea, right, of South Korea, that we do see here as well. And so let's read through it once more uh, by Esther Chung that we have, right? So, uh, Korean and Japanese uh, parliamentary members agreed to work to improve relations in a meeting in Seoul on Wednesday. A Japanese parliamentary de delegation headed by Fukushiro Nukaga, a member of the Liberal Democratic Party and head of the Japan Korea Parliamentary Association, met with National Assembly Speaker Park Pyong suk at the assembly in Western Seoul, we hope that Korea and Japan will be able to face their history together and develop a future oriented relationship from here, Park said, according to his office. The Yoon suk yeol government, which began its first day on Tuesday, has said it wants to improve ties with Japan. Relations are in a deep freeze over a number of historical issues, uh, including compensation for Korean victims of Japanese wartime sexual slavery and forced labor, both of which stem from 1945 the Japanese occupation of Korea. Both Korea and Japan now know fully well each other's positions on these issues. Park said in the meeting, what we need is resolved with will from the leaders to bring more con countries to engage on levels deeper than friendly gestures. In response to Nukaga, stressed that it is important that politics don't get in the way of the people so that can develop direct people-to-people -people ties. Uh, Japan recently announced in its intention to open its borders to foreign tourists, though only fully vaccinated ones as early as the next month. The country is currently closed to tourists. The forced labor issue, uh, the forced labor issue, including court rulings from Korea to liquidate some Japanese companies' assets to compensate forced laborers, was discussed during the meeting, according to the speaker's office. Traveling with Nukaga in the delegation were lawmakers Takeo Kawamura and Seishiro Ito from the Korean side Democratic Party lawmaker Lee Jae-jung joined the meeting. And so once again, uh, sort of the political sort of coming together of the Southern officials and the Japanese officials and how they have formed uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, bridges, right, uh, warmer bridges between the two uh, nations that we do see here, right, being formed that uh, we would have read through as well, right? So once again, another uh, sort of interesting article that we do see about improving our relations with Japan, right? So a lot of uh, Japan-related articles that we do see here as well. Uh, but the next article, right, would be by uh, Shin Ming Ho, right, who would have written uh, in the article that uh, in a recent survey on diplomatic challenges facing the Yoon suk administration, improving relations with Japan came in last. In sixth place, the respondents expressed caution about China while still valuing trilateral security cooperation among South Korea, the United States, and Japan. 
Needless to say, checking China and seeking a better tripartite security cooperation calls for improving Seoul's relations with Tokyo, and yet South Koreans tend to make light of better relations with Japan due to their deep-rooted distrust of Japan followed by North Korea and China. In other words, Koreans turn away from the need for improved relations with Japan because of their hostilities toward Tokyo despite the need for cooperation with Japan for security, while entrusting the job of fostering trilateral cooperation to the U.S. Amidst the tense strategic competition between America and China, pressure to choose between them grows. It is increasingly difficult for South Korea to weigh the losses from its choice, whatever it will be. Under such tough and uh, volatile circumstances, it is advantageous for Seoul to join hands with Tokyo beyond its choice between Washington and Beijing. In this respect, the top diplomatic priority for the new South Korean government should be placed on improving relations with Japan. The new South Korean government will have no trouble reinforcing the alliance with the U.S., which topped the list in the survey. The nuclearization of North Korea's second place will bear no concrete fruit, but depending on the will of the conservative administration in South Korea, the progress can be made in relations with Japan. The stakes are too high for South Korea to leave them unintended or use them for political pur purposes domestically. A balance of power in Northeast Asia is needed for South Korea to make strategic room to, uh, to effectively respond to China's threat. Uh, South Korea cannot rely on the U.S. for national security forever. Uh, the theatist of America First is gaining tra traction in America, whether it be governed by conservative or liberal administrations. If the U.S. chooses to dismantle one of its alliances based on its national interests, South Korea could be incorporated into the sphere of China. But if South Korea and Japan cooperate closely, both countries can secure strategic autonomy elastic enough to endure the centripetal force of China. They can jointly cope with China's pressure and share their burdens. That can help c encourage uh, America to stay in Northeast Asia and build more equal relations with South Korea and Japan. Uh, South Korea and Japan. Japan. Uh, that will also help establish a foundation to effectively balance security cooperation paradigm for uh, South Korea. America and Japan and an economic cooperation of powers for South Korea, China, and Japan. That's a step to strike a strategic balance rather than uh, be, swept, be swept in the fierce contest between the U.S. and China. Though you, South Korea and Japan compete on the economic front, they are complementary in many areas. Uh, if the two cooperate amidst the technological decoupling between the U.S. and China, it can help them stem pressure from Washington and Beijing or take advantage of their domestic markets. Technological cooperation between Seoul and Tokyo can help them jointly, uh, jointly, uh, jointly, and will continue. Uh, Okay. Okay. So we'll try to see if there would be a continuation. Uh, but once again, uh, uh, this article would be talking about uh, sort of the uh, the relationships between not only South Korea and uh, Japan, but also which that relates uh, with China and U.S. And so all of these international relations would be uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, coupled with one another or joined with one another. And so. Uh, the rising sort of competition between U.S. and China and how South Korea has to take sides in certain sense, right? Uh, miss the different countries and actually holding hands with Japan might uh, sort of ease this sort of, uh, 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 this sort of uh, pressure that South Korea seems to be feeling at this moment, according to this article, between China and U.S., right? And so actually holding ties with Japan might ease that tension or that rivalry between China and U.S., uh, according to this economist, right, who would have analyzed, or uh, this uh, analyst who would have analyzed, uh, who would have uh, a analyzed the uh, the country relations and uh, amidst the different countries that he would have addressed here, and so uh, yeah, he calls for improving the relations with Japan in, as a strategic sort of uh, move in amidst the international sort of arena with the with the relationship with China and the and, and US right that he calls for in this uh, very article that we would have read through so once again uh, we'll see if we can find the rest of the article uh, but uh, we'll read through one uh, one more article uh, 
another article about uh, University of Seoul aims to foster global urban planners. And so the next uh, uh, article that we have would be on Seoul National University, one of uh, the uh, most uh, sort of renowned or prestigious sort of uh, uh, universities, right, uh, in Seoul. Seoul to the world, the world to Seoul, right, that we have. And, uh, uh, yeah, it's not the most, right? Uh, so, uh, as head of the uh, globe, uh, so starting from the uh, beginning, would be globalization has been a core pursuit for many Korean universities in recent years as they seek to attract the brightest minds from the all corners of the world. The presence of foreign students across co college campuses comes at a crucial time for the country as the dip in fertility rate is swiftly changing demographics and taking a toll on school systems. Last year, Korea hosted more than 150,000 international students despite the raging COVID-19 pandemic, mostly of those from Asian uh, countries with a passion for Amer Korean culture and language who arrived for better career prospects in the Meet the President series. The Korea Chungang Day, we asked the presidents of the pro prominent Korean universities to introduce their schools and explain their globalization strategies. As a uh, Head of the university specializing in urban planning, Su Sun Pak, saw a fresh uh, opportunity abroad at the time when the global population was increasing by more than 80 million annually and with more people flocking from rural to urban areas, the president of the University of Seoul deemed that it was a uh, school's mission to share city building know-how with developing countries, then came Mongolia. Mongolia wasn't one of uh, wasn't on our list of of uh, options from day one. Such uh, Suo told the Korea Chungang Daily in an interview at his office in Dongdaemun District, the eastern Seoul, last month. We initially looked into other countries, but we found gaps between the expectations and reality. Luckily, with Mo Mongolia, the obs the obstacles seemed surmountable. The public university has come a long way to trying in trying to build a campus in the Eastern, East Asian nation, but more remains to be done. So I hope the new Yoon Seok-yeol administration will help take the final steps by discussing the plan with the Mongolian gover government uh, and know-how and experiences funded by the Seoul uh, Metropolitan Government Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport. The program has trained a total of 367 students to date, including 141 from five continents who are career and Vietnam. But what we uh what we realized not far uh let's take a look uh far uh, in those, so when we begin thinking about their options, that's when Mongolia comes to mind. On top of the fact that Korea and Mongolia are on a bilateral summit, <clears throat> if the two leaders agree on the campus and provide seed money, we'll be able to have a really strong start. We already received the green light from the Mongolian government. Uh, now we just need this, uh, the same signal from the Korean government. Surprise uh, visit, I had no idea they were coming. They thanked me for the great education experience they had in Seoul. So again, uh, sort of the uh, the interview that we would have seen, right? Uh, as head of the university specializing in urban planning, So Sun Tak saw a fresh opportunity abroad at a time when the global population was increasing by more than 80 million annually, and with uh, more people flocking from rural to urban areas, the presence of the University of Seoul deemed it was his school's mission to share city building know-how with developing countries. Then came Mongolia. <clears throat> Mongolia wasn't on our list of uh, options from day one. So told the Korea Chungang Daily in an interview at his office in Dongdaemun district, eastern Seoul, last month. We initially looked into other countries, but we found gaps between the expectations and uh, reality. Luckily, with Mongolia, the obstacles seemed surmountable. The public university has come a long way in trying to build a campus in the East Asian nation, but more remains to be done. So I hope the new Yoon suk administration will help take the final steps by discussing the plan with the Mongolian government at the summit. I think about the campus every day, says So. I hope for at least a partial opening before my term ends in 10 months. During the interview, Sao talked about his ambitions for Mongolia and how he thinks the campus would be would benefit both countries. The following are edited uh, excerpts for the conversation. 
for those who are familiar with the U.S., uh, how would how would you describe your school? The U.S. is the only four-year public university in Korea that's funded by a local government office. More than 60% of the school's finances are backed by the Seoul uh, Metropolitan Government, which allows us to offer affordable, high-quality education. Since the mid-1970s, the university has fostered talent to solve the various uh, urban problems of our time regarding city planning, transportation, safety, and the environment. Over the years, our school has also strived to invite bright international students to the campus with the help of Seoul's Global City Network. At the International School of Urban Sciences, we run the International Urban Development Program, a master's course though, through which we invite young public officials from developing countries to share our city building know-how and experiences funded by the Seoul Metropolitan Government, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Environment, and the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, and Transport. The program has trained a total of uh, 367 students to date, including 141 from five continents who are currently enrolled. We're also planning to establish a global campus in Mongolia as part of the broader vision to create an urban census hub in the Northeast Asia. With financial help from Korea's central government, we are working to establish an urban planning education course at the Royal University of Phnom Penh in Cambodia to help train urban experts there. How is the U.S. Uh, different from other Korean universities? We have the finest uh, faculty, cheap uh, tuition and dorms, uh, various scholarships, opportunities to tour cities around the globe, a beautiful campus, and a gateway to accessing the accessing Seoul's rich uh, post experiences and know-how. At the graduate school level, students can conduct all sorts of research on urban problems, smart cities, and urban big data using Seoul's uh, public data system. During seasonal breaks, we provide internship opportunities to our students in the International Urban Development Program at the Seoul, Na Seoul Metropolitan Government and other organiza organizations affiliated with the city. Why are you trying to build a campus in Mongolia? Initially, we had several other countries in mind like China, India, and Vietnam. But what we realized not far into deliberation was that it's incredibly difficult for financially pr financial perspective to build a campus in those places so when we began thinking about their options that's when Mongolia came to mind on top of the fact that Korea and Mongolia are on very friendly terms Mongolia has precious as a special spacious land and a huge desire huge desire to foster talent the drawbacks however were a small population cold weather and political instability so our next job was to figure out how to overcome those obstacles and how did that turn out uh, with the first problem we figured we could build the campus in the suburbs of Ulaanbaatar the capital given that the capital already seems overcrowded we also thought that we could build a vi virtual learning system so that students living far away could attend classes easily. This will also solve the second problem regarding the weather. When it gets too cold, another option would be to invite the students to Korea, allowing them a chance to study abroad here. If we could somehow build this network uh, connecting the U.S. with other Korean universities outside the Seoul metropolitan area, we could also have the students study in other schools under a partnership program. What about the third issue with political instability? Our solution to that was to build uh, a trust at the central government level, not between local governments. We figured this should be on the agenda of the bilateral summit. If the two leaders agree on the campus and provide seat money, we'd be able to have a really strong start. We already received the green light, uh, green light from the Mongolian government. Now we just need the same signal from the Korean government. What's your ideal image of a globalized U.S.? And an ideally globalized U.S. would be the one in which Korean and the foreign uh, professors, researchers, and students all work together to come up with new ideas and where their research contributes to our society and the international community. community. What remains to be done to turn that idea into reality as urban pro problems regarding housing, transportation, and the environment continue to grow more serious in many cities around the world, we're seeing an increasing demand from developing countries to share our soul's know-how. In light of our competitiveness in the urban sciences field, I think the U.S. needs to design an experts-based educational system through which we can pass on our knowledge and experiences. On campus, we need more foreign professors and, and students to create an international vibe. 
Can you share any special moments with international students when I traveled to Mongolia in 2019 to discuss plans for the Mongolian campus? About a dozen Mongolians who introduced themselves as U.S. graduates came to see me on a surprise visit. I had no idea they were coming. They thanked me for the great education and experience they had in Seoul, and I was so grateful. It was then that I felt education had no boundaries. What would you like to say to students abroad who are considering studying in Korea? The U.S. ranked 11th in the Chungang Ilbo's annual college ranking last year and 4th in the Educational Conditions category. This record in scholarships in the dormitory acceptance rate, among other variables. Other educational institution rate, which shows how much we invest in education and give back to the students, is 529%, the highest among all, na all national and public universities in Korea. Based on these strengths, the U.S. will continuously support international students in helping them with their studies in Korean settlement. President Bio uh, Sosun Tuck is the ninth president of the U.S. Bill's four-year term began in March 2019. He was a professor at the school's Department of uh, Urban Administration for almost uh, for nearly two decades prior. So played numerous roles on, on and off campus, including as president of the Korean Urban Management Association in 2017 and as the dean of the U.S. College of uh, Urban Sciences from 2013 to 2017. He earned his bachelor's and master's in urban administration at the U.S. and Ph.D. in town planning at the Newcastle University in Britain. Okay, so once again, uh, <coughs> uh, so uh, the uh, the president uh, sort of talked about right uh, the efforts to build uh, sort of uh, U.S. and other uh, sort of schools in other countries as well, right, including Ulaanbaatar. Uh, Mongolia, right, that we find as well, and also how to uh, combat those uh, challenges in those places by building online programs or uh, sort of uh, building trust with the central government. So again, uh, efforts to build uh, sort of schools in those uh, developing contexts, right, that we do see as well, right, that uh, the president of uh, Seoul National University uh, talked about, right, that we, might, we would have uh, read through. Uh, so uh, one, uh, the the next article that we'll be reading through would be busy second day for a new president, right? On uh, President Yoon Seok Yeol, right? Who, uh, uh, who, uh, uh, who uh, 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 recently, right, started working, and so we'll read through the article, right? And we'll, uh, yeah, we will read through the article, and we'll come back in the next uh, video with more articles. Uh, but yeah, the article will read a more relaxed look, but steep. Steely words about Pyongyang's threats, right? Uh, President Yoon suk yeol called on his aides to monitor the impact of possible North Korean nuclear tests on security and state affairs in his first meeting with senior, se secre secre senior secretaries Wednesday. Kicking off a busy second day in office, Yoon uh, held the meeting with senior presidential secretaries at his new office in the Defense Ministry compound in Yongsan District, Central Seoul, and discussed security and economic challenges. The current security situation is tough, said Yoon. There's uh, talk of a resumption of North Korea's nuclear tests, and foreign countries are concerned. In case of tests, uh, such a situation occurs, you will have to closely monitor and prepare for not only how it affects security, but also but other area areas of state affairs. Uh, Yoon's remarks came after North Korea conducted a series of missile launches in recent weeks, tightening tensions on the peninsula. On March 24th, Pyongyang launched an uh, intercontinental ballistic missile, breaking a self-imposed moratorium on longer-range missiles kept since late 2017. Analysts have said that North Korea could also be preparing a seventh nuclear test possibly around U.S. President Joe Biden's visit to Seoul next week for a summit with Yoon scheduled for May 21. During, mes during Wednesday's meeting, Yoon also addressed uh, economic difficulty, saying inflation was the biggest problem. On the same day, uh, Yoon's defense minister, Lee jong seok called for a third and immediate response in case of a direct provocation from Pyongyang. Newly un newly uh, inaugurated Lee, a retired three-star general and former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff JCS, made the remarks in his first meeting with the top military brass under the UN administration to evaluate 
North Korean Transit reviewed the South's readiness, South's readiness posture. Attendees included the JCS chief and commander level officials. They evaluated North Korea's recent uh, missile provocations, including its ICBM and submarine launched uh, ballistic missile launches, as well as signs of preparations for a nuclear test at the Pyongyang nuclear test site North Hanyong province. Uh, the security situation on the Korean Peninsula, including the advancement of including the advancement of North Korea's missile threat and the possibility of a nuclear test, is very serious. Said Lee, according to his ministry, we must maintain a firm readiness posture in the domains of land, sea, and air to proactively respond to security threats from all directions. It continued, if North Korea carries out a direct provocation, we will respond sternly and immediately according to the rights of self-defense. In his inaugural speech, uh, Lee also pledged to strengthen the South's free access system designed to counter North Korean security threats. The South Korean free access system was a term abandoned by the Moon Jae-in administration and revived by Yoon during his presidential campaign. It refers to the three defenses against North Korean uh, New, uh, nuclear and missile threats, a kill chain preemptive strike system, Korean air and missile defense system, and Korea massive punishment and retaliation plan. On uh, Wednesday, Yoon appointed Kim Kyu-hyun, a former Deputy National Security Advisor and Vice, uh, Vice Former Minister, as Director of the National Intelligence Service. Kwon chun Tech, a former NIS official and diplomat, was named first deputy director of the NIS, a post that directly deals with North Korean intelligence. Yoon was sworn in as a uh, Korean president in a ceremony Tuesday, attended by some 40, 41,000 people, including former presidents and uh, foreign dignitaries. And so once again, uh, sort of the North Korean uh, sort of uh, Pyongyang sort of relationships that Yoon Suk Yeol or the new president uh, is uh, uh, is planning to build, right? A more relaxed, sort of steeply, steely words about Pyongyang's threat, and so the type of uh, sort of polit uh, policy or political uh, stance that Yoon Suk Yeol takes, right, takes uh, towards uh, North Korea and its use of. Uh, nuclear uh, tests, right? And so the type of uh, policies or the direction that he plans to take on this uh, sort of uh, relationship with uh, North Korea, right, that we would have seen uh, in this very uh, article, right, that we would have read there. And so again, uh, we will be coming back in the next video with more articles, right, uh, news around the world as well as in Korea, right, that we'll come back with. Uh, so that we can take a look at more variety of uh, different uh, topics, right, uh, in the next video as well.